You're listening to The Valley Current. Hi, Steve. How you doing? Hey there. Good afternoon, Jack. How are you? So welcome into The Valley Current. I really appreciate you agreeing to join my podcast. We've been doing this for a few years. We started before the pandemic. And the goal was to give people insight to what's going on in Silicon Valley, both the geographic Silicon Valley that we know and the national different little Silicon Valleys that are popping up in Miami and other places throughout the United States as this entrepreneurship trend continues. And of course, uh, your role at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office is a big one and the role particularly in San Jose, California, which has a beautiful office, I've been there, and you can actually get parking nearby, so it's great. Give us a couple of minutes about your background because you've got a lot of experience doing this stuff. Sure, and I, I appreciate the opportunity, uh, Jack, and, and uh, I don't know if you had a chance to meet uh, my, my colleague, uh, Jera Edwards. Uh, she'll be kind of joining me on this and, and we'll be tag teaming together. So. Uh, my name is Steve Koziel. I currently serve as the acting regional director for the Silicon Valley Regional Office of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, we're one of four regional offices uh, across the United States, uh, and we're relatively new. Each of these regional offices is uh, is about 10 years old or, or under, and uh, we're, we're really the first time that the USPTO has had a footprint outside of the Washington, D.C. area, uh, with some limited exceptions. Um, but it's, a, it's the first permanent presence outside of the Washington, D.C. area for the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And I, I think that is a reflection, Jack, of, of exactly what you, what you said in your introduction, is that innovation is not bound by geography, right? There's there's innovation across this country, and as an agency that uh, protects and, and nurtures American innovation, uh, we need to be in the same communities as as our innovators. Do a better job of connecting with the various innovation communities across the country, and so that's where the regional offices uh, really come into play and and serve to better connect the stakeholders. Uh, across our respective regions to the resources that the U.S. Patent and Trademark uh, has to offer. Uh, and so just by way of background, uh, I started my career as a, as a patent examiner. So I was very much uh, in the trenches and uh, working on patent examination. And uh, now a lot of what I do in, in this role is to better connect the, uh, the innovative community across the Western region of the United States uh, to the innovation resources available uh, through the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and, and really better understand, you know, where our community is at, you know, where their needs are, and and try to understand how we can uh, get the local innovation community the resources that they need to be successful to protect their innovation, uh, and to grow uh, American businesses along the way. So. Uh, that's a that's a big part of why we're out here. Uh, like I said, we're you know we're a 200 plus year old federal agency, but these regional offices are are less than 10 years of that time. So we're we operate still very much like a startup within a, a well established company. Uh, so it gives us some some flexibility to try new things to to see what works. Uh, but ultimately to better connect uh, with our stakeholders across the region and, and better serve the uh, the American public across the, the Western region of the United States. Right, I put up the website, you've got a great website, and of course it, it identifies the five different locations that really four in addition to the big one in Alexandria, Virginia, and that includes San Jose, California, covering of course what's listed, California, Nevada, Oregon, Washington, Arizona, Alaska and Hawaii is. And so I'm, I'm just gonna throw a few questions at you because lots of clients sort of come in asking very basic questions and you are an expert. And so I'm just gonna throw a few of these at you and ask you to just, you and, and uh, your colleague, Jera, to answer as you see fit because new inventors and entrepreneurs always wanna know what's the best way to get started, 
How do they know what the process should be? Can they do the process themselves? Do they need to hire a lawyer. Those are usually batched together with, you know, get me started. So tell us what you would say to that kind of question. Sure. And I'll, I'll kick things off and invite Jared to, to jump in here. But I think that the number one takeaway that I would want to convey to someone who's new to the process, right, who's new to the patent system, the trademark system, or navigating intellectual property in general, uh, is, is that help is available. Right. And a lot of the help that's available is at you know, no cost or, or very low cost. Um, so I would encourage you strongly to avail yourself of some of the free public resources, uh, for example, that are included uh, and, and on offer by the USPTO as made available through, uh, through the website here that, uh, that Jack is sharing with you all. So uh, if you're on audio only or can't see Jack's uh, website, it's uh, USPTO.gov uh, is, is the place uh, to go. And if you, if you go to that page, you'll see a link to some of our upcoming educational events. Uh, all of the educational events that the USPTO offers are free to the public. Um, so I, I'd encourage you to spend some time looking through some of the upcoming events that we offer. Uh, I'll highlight two that I think may be of particular interest uh, to this group. And they're both recurring series that we offer uh, throughout the calendar year. Uh, one is uh, called our Path to a Patent series. Uh, it's a multi-part series uh, that discusses um, everything that a novice to intellectual property and the patent system uh, would want to know about how to get started, how to identify uh, what they have that may be eligible for a patent, uh, how to go about doing a search to see if someone has done that before, uh, and how to actually file your application, right? When do you need to think about working with an attorney? What can you do on your own to, uh, to maybe save a few bucks in the process, uh, and, and how to put that together? Um, so that's our path to a patent series. We typically offer it uh, once a quarter. So if you miss uh, if you miss a series, it's never more than a few months away. Uh, and then the second one I would highlight is our our trademark boot camps uh, series. So kind of how this path to a patent series walks you through everything you need to know to get uh, to go from idea to filing your patent application. Uh, the trademark bootcamp series uh, takes a very similar approach in, in teaching you how to how to go from your your brand uh, and and how to get that filed as the appropriate type of trademark application. So uh, again, this is offered uh, throughout the calendar year. So if you ever miss a series, the next uh, the next one is never uh, more than a few months away. Uh, and I'd, I'd strongly encourage you, uh, if, you've, if you've got something that you think you want to protect uh, in terms of a brand name or logo or slogan, uh, and you're not sure where to start, the Trademark Bootcamp series uh, is, is a fantastic entry into all things trademark. Um, and maybe the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with as far as free legal resources is uh, these uh, these boot camps and, and these Path to a Patent series are uh, kind of on-demand programming. They're taught by a live instructor. Uh, but a number of these uh, we offer on our YouTube channel as, uh, as kind of recorded on-demand videos as well. So if you're not able to attend a, a live session, uh, there's many of these videos available uh, on our, our YouTube page. Uh, and we encourage you to uh, to check those out as well. Of course, the the benefit to attending uh, a, a course taught by a, a live in-person instructor is that you get the ability to ask any questions that you may have and kind of do a deeper dive into some of the material. But uh, but we like to make the YouTube uh, videos available for folks on demand as well. Right, people can actually come to the physical office in San Jose and sit in a classroom style setting, right? Correct, correct. A lot of these programs uh, are now offered uh, hybrid 
as well so that those who are physically located in the San Jose region can come by our office to attend. Um, but we, uh, we welcome all comers through, the, uh, through a virtual showing uh, as, as well. So uh, when you go to uh, any individual event and try to register, they'll, they'll ask if, you're, uh, if you want to attend in person or, or virtually. Uh, and select what uh, what works best for where you are. And people gathering their own information and studying enough and learning enough for themselves without a lawyer, can they actually file their own provisional patent application themselves? Sure. Uh, Jared, do you want to jump in and, and talk through, you know, when to, when to contact an attorney and, and what makes sense to do on your own? Sure, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, that is a question that people have, you know, at what point should I seek legal advice or do I need to seek legal advice at all? And there's a little bit of a different answer, I would say, for, for trademarks and for patents. Um, for trademarks, it's, it's a little bit less complex of a process. Um, however, a lot of the considerations for trademarks are considered legal determinations. So all of our trademark examiners are lawyers and the work that they do is considered legal. Um, on the patent side, patent examiners are not attorneys, but they are experts in different uh, technical subject matter. Um, and when it comes to patent applications, although they aren't strictly legal determinations that are being made during the patent application process, they tend to be um, rather complicated applications. Um, and there are some considerations that initially applicants may not understand, for example, regarding disclosure and the amount of information that it may be um, advisable to disclose about your application is a very important issue. And it's something that initially you'll want to be very careful about because although um, there will be some uh, publication of your application at one point and things do become public. Initially, one of the concerns with patent applications is securing a filing date. And the filing date that you secure is also uh, related to when you wanna first make your public disclosures about your invention. So people may be trying to, you know, um, drum up some interest for funding or, you know, other concerns. But initially, you'll want to make sure that one of the legal concepts that you do understand about filing for a patent application is the importance of um, how much you're disclosing and what exactly you're disclosing about your invention initially. Um, so that's, I know that's sort of a lot that I started out with. Um, but you can, uh, you know, the courses that we offer give a lot more information about the patent application process. And it certainly is a process that you can begin on your own. Um, you can certainly come to our website and do a search for prior art on your own. Um, and we also have some courses that will help walk applicants through that process as well. Uh, but we do also have listings of um, attorneys that are willing to provide their services for free, which we call pro bono legal services. So our website also has information about how you can find out more about what attorneys in your area are willing to do that and, and what the requirements are for them to take on a client pro bono. And we also have some law schools that have clinics that will assist um, members of the community for either free or for uh, a much reduced fee. Because a lot of the expense of patent applications is from the money that's required to, to pay the attorney or the agent for preparing the application, since it is, it does tend to be a complicated process. Right, so when you see the basic questions that come up uh, in these various classrooms, I would imagine one that you see often is, what's the difference between a utility patent and a design patent, because people must ask that basic question all the time. How do you answer that? Sure, I'll I'll, I'll take a, a swing at that. I think that's a, it's a great question because it it kind of gets into the the weeds a little bit more in in terms of patents and and what they actually protect. Uh, and and I think a lot of people, uh, you know, when they think about oh I've I I need a patent if I've got an invention, and they 
they hold the idea of an invention to a very high standard. It's got to be some kind of breakthrough or, you know, life-saving product or game-changing invention. Uh, and and that's, that's not really in line with the legal standard of what qualifies for, uh, for a patent in the United States. Um, and, and so uh, the traditional patents for inventions, right, if you think back to, to the light bulb and, and to the automobile, um, those are what we call uh, utility patents in the United States, right? And um, those represent any new machine or article of manufacture or composition of matter uh, or improvements there too that are eligible for for patent protection so uh, essentially you have to show that your invention uh, one has not been done before uh, so there's no public record of somebody uh, doing what you invented and two that it would not have been obvious for uh, for someone to uh, to do that invention in, in exactly the way that you've done it and that you've described it. So um, that's a much lower bar than I think a lot of people uh, uh, you know have in the public imagination uh, as far as what it takes to uh, to actually qualify for a utility patent here in the United States. Um, so you also Jack asked about uh, design patents. Uh, which I think not a lot of people know about, but once they hear about it, uh, they, they really see the benefits and they, they really see, oh yeah, I might actually have something that could be eligible for, for a design patent here. So, um, so if, if a utility patent kind of protects what your invention does, kind of what it is and what it does, uh, think of a design patent as protecting how it looks. Now that's a bit of an oversimplification, but a design patent protects the ornamental uh, look of a functional object. Uh, and one really classic example for people to think through if they're trying to get a mental picture is uh, think of the iconic uh, glass Coca-Cola bottle. Uh, right, the, the, the ornamental design of the Coke bottle is protected or was protected when it was you know originally created through through design patent right so if if what you're trying to protect and what you think is innovative about your product is how it looks uh, then you may be in the realm of design patents uh, compared to trying to protect what your product does or, or what its individual physical components are and how they interoperate, right? Then you're in the realm of, of utility patents. So uh, it's, it's a matter of, you know, taking a step back and asking yourself, um, you know, what is it that you have that you're trying to protect uh, and, and where does the value come from? Does the value derive from the function of the product or does the value derive from the appearance of the product or is it a combination of both? And I think maybe uh, in, in the future, we can talk a little bit about uh, strategies that involve diff multiple types uh, of protection, uh, including utility design patents and, and maybe even trademarks as well. Right, because clients will often say, well, what's the difference between a patent, whether you call it design utility, and a copyright, and what's the difference between a patent, copyright, and say, trade dress, as well as something that's trade secret? They'll ask all those questions because they'll hear all these concepts in one batch. I don't think there's a short answer to that, but if you want to take a stab at explaining it, I think our audience would appreciate it. I'll start and invite Jara to, to weigh in a little bit there. Um, and so, so far, what we've, we've talked about really um, is, is patents, 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 and kind of getting the distinction between utility and design patents. Um, but when you start talking about things like, like trade dress, uh, you're, you're in the realm of, uh, of, of trademark law uh, then. And, and so if you remember one thing about trademarks, uh, right, if patents protect inventions, um, you know, trademarks uh, serve as source identifiers 
of a particular uh, uh, product. So when you when you see the iconic uh, you know golden arches that that represent the McDonald's brand, right? You instantly identify the source of that of that restaurant based on its its mark, right? So. Uh, so that's what all trademarks at, at the root of it, right? Trademarks serve as source identifiers so that the consumer uh, or potential consumer of a product can readily identify the source of a particular good or service. Trade dress to your to your question, Jack, uh, is kind of a, a one way of, of securing trademark protection and specifically trade dress uh, is a way to protect the uh, the visual appearance of um, of a product, and and really specifically, its packaging uh, is where we most often see trade dress. So, uh, so a trademark might be the individual uh, symbol itself of the golden arches of McDonald's, or the uh, the classic uh, red and white script uh, that spell out Coca Cola that you see on the face of the bottle. Um, but the but the overall packaging of the product uh, is is something that can be protected uh, through trade dress. Um, so the combination of the box that the product is in, the color scheme on the box, the um, you know the the way that it's presented to the consumer uh, in in the retail setting, uh, all examples of of trade dress. Um, and just to take it one step further, that even extends to some physical uh, retail stores as well. Uh, so one example that that may be uh, well known uh, is the layout of uh, of an Apple store, uh, right? Any Apple store that you walk into, right, has a, a readily um, consistent uh, layout from from store to store, and that that layout of the retail environment itself is something that is is protected through trade dress, uh, and very similar through restaurants as as well, right? If a restaurant is trying to establish consistency uh, across his brand, so that it, the consumer gets the same uh, visual impression anytime they walk into a restaurant, regardless of location. Uh, that is something that is is protected through uh, through trade dress uh, as as well. And you know, trade secrets, just as suggested by the title, would would pertain. Uh, I think the the most obvious example would be something like a recipe, which you don't want anybody to know because it's it's so hard to enforce. Um, whether or not someone is copying your recipe if you've made it public. So a trade secret might be some formula, um, some other aspect of what you're selling that you're able to keep secret without you know, anyone knowing um, and benefit from being the only person using that recipe and having that benefit. Um, and then copyright, and, and if you're able to see uh, the visual that Jack is sharing, um, there's some description there of, of what's legally protected. And so copyright um, applies more to, uh, like we think of novels and song lyrics and you know, works of art, of, of those types of art. I would say one important distinction to keep in mind when you're talking about these different types of intellectual property protection is that unlike trademarks and copyrights, um, patents don't actually give you necessarily the right to do the thing that you've described in your patent. What a patent will do is give you the right to prevent others from making or selling or using what you've described in your patent application. But there may be others who have patents on some aspect of what you're doing that also have a right to prevent someone from making, selling, or using a particular method or a particular product. And you may have to come to some agreement with them before you can actually start producing your product or selling your product. Um, trademarks, once you've secured your trademark, and, and even before you've actually even filed for your trademark, often you may already be using that um, as you know in your business. So there is a, a bit of a distinction between patents and the other types of intellectual property protection as you know a right to exclude rather than um, a right to practice. Coca-Cola is a good example. 
the formula for Coca-Cola has been kept secret for over a hundred years. And the bottle, of course, is a very famous bottle. And the brand, of course, is a very famous brand and registered trademark. And of course, all of those things can exist concurrently. And you can keep the formula secret, the recipe, as you say, secret. But you can also get the registered trademark on the Coca-Cola name. And that turns out to be a pretty important asset for the Coca-Cola business. And there's a certain trade dress and the look of the packaging that goes as well. So those are all really good examples of, of concurrent use. Would you agree with that generally, or do you have a distinction to draw? I, I think that's a, that's a great point, Jack. And I, I think it, it helps to think through that. Um, you know, Coca-Cola could have filed for a patent application on their formula, right? It, it's a composition of matter, right? And, you know, that that's something that could be protected through a patent, but they chose to protect it using a trade secret. Now, now why is that? Why does that make sense for, for Coca-Cola? And I think that the answer there is, you know, trade secrets last indefinitely, right? As long as you, the owner of the trade secret are diligent about maintaining secrecy and and you you know you you avoid letting it out into the public and no one is able to reverse engineer it right you're able to maintain that trade secret for you know for hundreds of years potentially right patents on the other hand expire right the term of a patent is 20 years from the date that you first filed for that application right so if you know, rewind a hundred years, and if you're, you know, at the Coca-Cola company, right, and you'd, you'd be hoping to be selling this product for, you know, more than the 20 years that the patent uh, would, uh, would would protect you. Um, so the way to extend that protection would be to maintain trade secrecy and really lock down that recipe uh, to prevent it from, from getting out into the public. Um, so I think what it illustrates is that there's a, there's, a different, uh, there's a different role for each of these types of intellectual property, uh, patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets, depending on what you have that's valuable and what it is that you're trying to protect, right? So, so maybe the, one of the more important questions you can ask yourself as a business is, Okay, what am I sitting on? What what do I have um, that that that's valuable to me and to my company? What's the appropriate or the most appropriate form of protection uh, that will suit my my business needs and and suit what I'm I'm trying to do uh, with this with this enterprise? And so uh, that's where this this chart that that Jack is sharing uh, that talks about the what a trademark, patent, and copyright uh, respectively protect uh, is, is a really helpful uh, starting point. Uh, for businesses to consider, uh, and is really the the topic of a lot of our introductory uh, programming that the USPTO uh, offers as well. Uh, in just about every one of our intro to intellectual property series uh, that we host either online or or on on YouTube, uh, we we walk through various examples and and kind of help people to try to understand, you know, that, you know what they're sitting on may not be appropriate for a patent or for a copyright, but it may be perfect for, for a trademark or, or a design patent even. So uh, there's different forms of protection out there and it's, uh, it's up to you as the inventor, as the business owner, as the brand owner to, uh, to really help, you know, help yourself identify uh, what's most appropriate based on what you want to do uh, with that particular invention or brand. So I have one last question before we wrap up, which is what actually happens when an issued patent expires and the work falls or the invention falls into the public domain? And how does one potentially take advantage of that, the way this 20-year period typically operates? Sure. It's, it's, a, it's a great question. And, and I think it, it really cuts to the heart of the patent system, uh, which is that it's a, it's a quid pro quo, 
right? Um, you as the inventor, in order to receive a patent, uh, you have to tell us, the Patent and Trademark Office, um, how you came up with that invention, right? Uh, in, in many ways, a patent application is essentially a description of what your invention is, you know, how you came up with it, and is in sufficient detail so that someone else of ordinary skill could pick up your application, read it, and understand uh, what the invention was and how to go about making it, right? So you're giving up a lot of sensitive information potentially in that patent application. Uh, and in exchange for that, right, you get 20 years of exclusivity, uh, whereas Jera alluded to before, you can prevent others from making, using, importing that which you have described in the patent. So, you know, you get that 20 year window of exclusivity, um, but at the end of that 20 years, that patent expires and everything that you disclosed in that patent goes into the public domain and others can, can you know, then start making, manufacturing, you know, using that which you had disclosed in the patent. Um, maybe the most common example that people hear of is, is when a, you know, a block, blockbuster pharmaceutical drug uh, loses its patent protection and then is, is eligible for, for so-called generic uh, status then, right? So, uh, so it, it's, you know, you get 20 years to profit from your idea to figure out how to make it, make as much money as you can out of it. Um, but at the end of that 20 years, that invention goes back into the public domain and is is free for uh, for all to to use and and to build upon. Um, so hopefully that strikes the right balance between incentivizing innovation and encouraging entrepreneurs to uh, to get their patents and protect themselves and to profit from that period of exclusivity while simultaneously benefiting the public by creating that. Um, uh, that, that public domain asset at the end of the 20 year period. Great, Steve and Jera, this has been very, very, very helpful and provides a nice background. I know we just scratched the surface and hopefully we can dig in a little deeper on each of these subjects in future podcasts, but this has been a great use of the half hour and I appreciate both of you coming on to the Valley Current this afternoon. Thank you for all the great work you do and for running the San Jose office. I will be referring various people to that office and look forward to meeting with you again and probably in person in San Jose at some point in the future. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Tune in next time on The Valley Current.